this is the very last slide before we start preparing for the exam. Okay. So we'll take our time. We'll get through this. Okay, we've already talked about all this business, right? Right, we know all this. Hey, I'm a non melting Don't forget that. That really hydrogen for charge, somebody mentioned earlier, it would be plus one when it makes charge. That's acids. But for a lot of stuff that it does, it kind of really goes over there and acts like a non metal So you'll see it in different ways. So what we're going to talk about is types of bonding. So here's the way to think about it. I got three areas, or two areas on the table. I got the non-metal and the metal part. You with me? So if I put a metal and a non-metal together, it has a type of bonding. If I put two non-metals together, it has a type of bonding. If I put two metals together, that has a type of bonding. Those are the three types of bonding. That's the only possibilities. You with me? I got two things. How can I combine them? Well, one with one, one with the other, or one together. That's how that, that can happen. Okay? So ionic's the first. This is metal bound to a non-metal. It's green. Okay? So you guys ready for this? So it's just kind of like this, right? Here I am. I'm the metal. Could you see that? I'm wimpy. I can Here's my electron. Here's the non-metal. I come near you, what are you going to do if you're non-metal? Push away. Yeah. Go for it. Eh! Right? What's my charge? And she is? Negative. Negative and opposites. And you're like, oh, I'm tough. I sold your lunch money. I'm like, yeah, but now we're stuck together forever. Like, ah, not what you thought. Right? Does that make sense? Is that, that's how, that's how ionic bonds are formed. They're formed between charged things. Now, I've already equipped you with this, and you go, okay, sodium likes to charge what way? Positive how many? Perfect. Chlorine likes to charge how which way? Negative one. Negative one. Boom, they charge. Bond by, bound by charge. That's an ionic bond. Hmm. Bound by charge, ionic bond. How do I know it's occurring? Metal and a non-metal. Same thing. If I had this, who's going to want the electrons? Who's the loser? Who's the winner? Look on the table. Lithium's hanging out over there, so is it going to want to hold it or lose electron? It loses, right? And then what about fluorine? Want it, right? Same idea, right? I'm lithium, you're fluorine, right? Same idea. So it goes like this. The charge becomes, which we've already talked about. By the way, in achieving that charge, they're both noble alike. Because lithium lost one, so it's a lot like helium. Fluorine gained one, look where it's sitting. When it gains one, it looks just like neon. See, they're using that Lewis concept still yet. And then they bond by charge. And the only thing is when you write them together, you just write them without the charge. It's assumed that the charge is canceled. These are called ionic compounds. Good stuff? <laughs> Net charge when they bond is always zero because I had a charge particle coming with enough negative charge particles that they cancel. Just some words that sometimes get stuck with this. If they have a negative anion, they're called an anion. If they have a positive, they're called a cation. I always say, remember that instead of a T, think of it like a positive sign, a cation. Those are, those are both anions, or uh, ions in general, but if you're being very specific, that's called a cation, that's called an anion. Just some terms, some, some <coughs> vocabulary for you. Metallic anions or 
ammonium bound to anionic polyatomic ions can fit in the same category. Okay, pull your polyatomic ion chart so I can show you what I mean. What is calcium like to take in a charge? Calcium. Anybody? What charge Plus would it? Two. Perfect. Now, pick polyatomic ion like sulfate off your table. What's the charge of it? So then, ionic bond, bound by charge. Tracking with me? So usually it's a metal and non-metal, but it can be a metal and a polyatomic anion, which is common. That's the whole table, right? They're almost all anions. They're all negative, 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 except for ammonium. So metal or ammonium and a non-metal and or polyatomic ion. You with me? There you go. Tracking? Ionic bonds. Ammonium? What's the charge on ammonium? Look on your polyatomic ion table. Plus one. Plus one. You can do this too, right? They bond by charge. And again, you don't put the charges in there when you bond them. You just cancel out the charge and write them as such. And you can keep going. Now, what happens here? I want to cancel charge. How many sodiums would it take to cancel that? Two. So, follow? Um, that's the wrong structure. Good job, Thompson. <laughs> it's sodium sulfate. <laughs> I was like, Dad, how about this? I said, follow, and everybody's looking at me with a weird look. How about this? Is that better? Whew! Oops. Does that make sense? I'm going to show you a little trick here. Got just a minute left. This is super cool. I'm going to show you something. What's assumed to be the number here? One. What's the charge on the sodium? What's the charge on the so sulfate? Negative two. Negative two. What's this? It's a trick that you can always kind of go like this. Here, I'll do another one. You ready? <clears throat> All right, I'll take lithium. What's the charge? Plus. I'm going to take nitrogen, nitride. What would its charge be? Negative. Cool. How many lithiums would bind to cancel the nitrogen? Three. True? Here's the trick. Ready for the trick? Change colors. And remember, it's a little color, okay? If I went up here, and if that's a one, right? It's assumed to be a one. <clears throat> Just a cool, it, it has to do with how they cancel. That's always going to work. Just like if you find a common denominator, you kind of use the same math trick. It's just, it'll help you moving forward. If there's a number in the smaller, like below, that number is always going to be negative? Because that number will be the charge of the anion, but it'll be negative if it's an anion. And then this will be the charge of the cation, but it will be positive, but it just will correlate that way, and that way they'll always cancel. It's just a trick. But if you work it out longhand, you're going to always be right. Okay? Everybody kind of tracking with me? 
That gets kind of helpful though, because you take something complicated like this, let's chart it on calcium. And then I'm going to take nitrogen once it's charged on it. Negative three, and it's like, oh, now how's this going to cancel? I can just use the trick. And go, oh, because if I had three of these, that would be a plus six, right? And if I had two of these, it would be a minus six. So they would charge cancel. So I took advantage of that trick to go, aha, that is the number down here. And that's the number down there. Set, you're ready for the exam. Um, and then I'll, we'll review today. Whatever we have time left, we'll just start talking about the exam. Sound good? And then just so you know how it works, then the exam will be active. <coughs> and we'll do it a week from today on Tuesday, or yeah, we'll go Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. That way you have a little bit of time. And that means any time in those 48 hours, I mean midnight, I don't care when you do it. Tuesday and Thursday, it comes on, get it done, set aside two hours to get it done. Does that work for everybody? And and here, here in a minute, if you're just like sitting there and all of a sudden like, holy crap, I can't, like I literally can't, then please talk to me before you leave class today so you and I can make arrangements to be like, Okay, I'll extend you till Thursday, and here's the time you need, and boom, here's where we're going to set it. Does that make sense? But don't do that if you're like, yeah, no, that's my whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean. I'm going to a concert. Well, I'm sorry. Okay, good? You with me? So Tuesday, Wednesday. I always use that example because I really had a student. Like, I was in South by Southwest. I couldn't, and I'm like, I wish I was there, but you can't use that as an excuse in this class. <laughs> Good for you. Awesome. But, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is where we, we're already through this, right? And by the way, maybe I got over that too quick because we talked about I just I always want to review this. We're talking about chemical bonding right now, right? It's all about the position on the table, how it bonds. So my goal, like, kind of this is the end of the material is this. If I tell you a metal bound to a metal, you'd go, oh, it's this type of bonding. I go, oh, it's a metal bound to a non-metal. You go, oh, it's this type of bonding. If it's two non-metals, you go, it's this type of bonding. That's what we're after right now. You with me? Okay. So the one we actually talked about was ionic. So who's kind of ahead of it can say, oh, based on, it's what bound to what? Metal to metal. Metal to non-metal. Or the kind of sneaky one that is also acts like a non-metal and on rare, rare, rare occasion of metal is a polyatomic ion. Yeah, I know. It says, so a hydroxide is a minus one charge. So is a chloride minus. See, see what I'm saying? Remember we learned these? These have what kind of charge? Negative one. Negative one. And plus three. Yeah. So anything that acts like that could bond by charge. You with me? Yeah. So here we go. And, if, and sometimes it helps. That number up there is plus one, plus two. Doesn't help out here so much. Right? But anyway, plus one, plus two. Then these are minuses because they're losers. So it's minus three, minus two, minus one. And then this guy's the plus three, the kind of the oddball that we also learn, right? Anyway, a polyatomic ion could also have a minus one plus, minus one, minus two charge, right? Like hydroxide, minus one. It'll bond just like a chloride would then, because they both have minus one. Do you like my fancy new laser? Can you tell them you're saying? It's a green light, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, you with me? The, the only substitution on the cationic side, the positive things, is ammonium, which is really a, it's all up, very unique. It's NH4 plus. So we can substitute in here like these guys. That they're all positive, right? So instead of having magnesium chloride, you could have ammonium chloride. Follow? Okay. So that's, that's pretty much it. 
Now, how do you describe the bonding? Like if I was trying to say, you know, and we are doing this in class, and I, what what is the bonding? How did what happens? Yeah, so basically this is like my description. I say, well, you know, non-metals grab electrons and metals give away. But once that happens, there, there's a cation, right? Which is, what does that mean? Positive. Positively charged, right? It's cation, right? Not like a cat. You, you did what with a cat's ion? What? That's freaky. What? No, no, no. A cat ion is a metal that is actually lost electrons. It's pat positively charged. And there's an anion which is negatively charged. What makes them bond? Yeah, well, what happens if you put opposite charges by each other? They exactly. sh stick, just like uh, the magnets, right? North Pole gets near South Pole, whoosh, they just stick by charge. So that's literally how the bonding occurs. And that's what I was, right? That little, I had to apologize later. I'm like, I didn't ask you, but, you know. <laughs> Sticking myself to that's weird. Get away from me. Right? You guys with me? Okay, so all make sense? And the way I described it is that I was showing you live, right? Like what you were talking about. Like, well, okay, this is a loser, so he loses his electron to this one, therefore this would be, you know, positive, and this would be negative, right? Which, by the way, I'm just pointing out, when that occurs, they're like a noble gas. Like, lithium, when it loses an electron, it's just like this guy. Fluorine, when it gains an electron, it's just like this. Kind of the driving force for why they gain and lose as many as they want to. So if this guy's gaining one, it looks just like the noble gases. If this guy gains two, see how it's, if this one gains three, one, two, three, it's just like argon. See, they're always trying to get to the noble gas. Okay, so anyway, all side notes. What do you have to do in this class? You gotta be able to look on the chart and say, well, that's number 19. You could say, that'll get what kind of charge? Plus one. Plus one. And you know it would stick to anything that's minus one, or minus two, or minus three, right? They would just, and that's ionic on. Right? Okay, good. So now, enough of that. We kind of did that. When they bond, they get a net charge. We don't write the charges in there anymore. We just cancel them out. Right? And then I walk through some more stuff. You know, and I gave example. Here's the polyatomic ion doing the same thing. Opposite charges attract. You put them together. You don't rewrite them with the charges. You just write them with the charge canceled. Right? That's that's all the ionic stuff. Good stuff. We got down to here. Hey, what, what what would happen here if it was a minus two and that was plus one? Well, it would attract two. Because if I attracted one, it would still be minus one. So it would attract another. And then it would be done attracting. And you would have this scenario like this. And you'd say it's sodium nitrate. It's two sodiums, one nitrate. Follow? And nothing's magical about this. If I walked it backwards, you'd go, hey, that's a nitrate. It's a minus one charge. That's a sodium. Plus, I mean, oh yeah, oh yeah. I still didn't correct these slides. Yeah, they're coming. All right. That's a sulfate. Minus two charge. It would attract two sodiums. We'd be good. All make sense? Okay. Now, I also pointed out that these salts start to build up, and that's why I had you <coughs> pass around sodium chloride. And I showed you with a magnifying glass, it, it builds the same cubic structure as the little bitty bitty salt crystal. You know, if you looked at the little salts and you saw that big one, they're like the same shape. It's because sodium and chloride just start stacking and they build a bigger and bigger crystal. Right? So, I'm just trying to help students understand. Like, so if I talked about that, I wouldn't try and count every sodium and every chloride and say like this. This is a small example. I wouldn't write it like this. You couldn't count the billions and billions of sodium and chlorides that made that crystal you saw in there, right? So we always write it in the reduced form. 
that's one to one. Tracking, so th this is all the stuff we talked about. All right, now this is kind of about where we ended, but just, okay. We sometimes call them salts or electrolytes. So those definitions I want people to know. Especially the salt one, because that's the one they'll throw you off. Chemist is talking about salt, you think he's talking about sodium chloride, table salt, like we all know and eat. But it could be any salt. I mean, there's literally millions of them, right? Any combination of cation and anion is salt. And then when it comes into the body, we call it electrolytes. Because of how the charges, the positive and negatives, work together to make our bodies work. Muscle impulse, nerve cell impulse, it's all electrical in nature. And you're like, why do I have electrical impulse and I don't even have a battery? Or maybe I need to change it. That's why I'm so worn out all the time. I just change my battery here. <laughs> no, it, the, the cations and anions are literally what is the source of electricity in the body. So we call them electrolytes. So, Oh, that's cool, that makes sense. Finally, right? Scientists aren't famous for naming things logically. You've got to throw in a Latin or Greek or whatever. All right, so here's examples you may have heard of. Now you can see, hey, yeah, it's not sodium chloride every time. You know, I go to soak after some hard workout, magnesium sulfate. You cook with this all the time, baking soda, baking powder, those are all salts bag chloride on the road during the winter, right? These are just salts, just, okay? All make sense? Okay, new, new bonding, you ready? This is new stuff, right? Think about where I am on the periodic table. I'm non-metal and non-metal. So by nature, are non-metals wimpy losing their electrons or are they greedy for them? They're greedy. Greedy, perfect, you guys are on track for me. <laughs> a sense of that. So now you're looking at, and by the way, for this hydrogen and hydrogen would uh, fit with the other non metals. Okay? It's, not it's not all of them. a positive charge. Yeah, so yes, you're, she, you're very, it's, hydrogen's a kind of, it plays both sides of the table. Later on, we're going to learn how it has a positive charge, but for now, for this kind of bonding, we think of it as covalent. You'll see when and where, okay? Okay, you ready? You're greedy? I, I'm not saying you're greedy, but are you? Know, in this example, you're greedy, and I'm greedy. You with me? Okay, here's your electron. Here's my electron. We're both greedy, so here we go. You know what's gonna happen, I'm like looking at your electron. I want that. Go ahead, because you're greedy, you're not gonna go. And you're gonna see my electron, what are you gonna do? Yeah, you are, but I'm greedy, I'm not letting go. Do you know we're now bond? We're bound, right? But we didn't. There was no charge involved. No one lost electrons, right? So weirdly, the two greedy people are sharing the electrons. <laughs> Isn't that weird? But it makes a bond, correct? So you now say electrons form or bonds formed by sharing electrons, not by charge, right? This isn't bonding because of charge, it's because they both reach out for the electrons and that bonds them. So if I kind of drew a picture, and I'm about to here, but I think this is, I'm gonna be very, very simple. Who can tell me what this element is? With just that little of information, can you tell me what that element is? You can. No one else knew the answer, but I knew you did. <laughs> what is this? Proton, electron, what do you call it? Yes, so if I had one proton, or would I, who would I be? I knew you knew that answer. I knew. I knew I could count on you. It's true. It's, this, is hi this is the person we were just talking about. Hi hydrogen, right? So now hydrogen comes near another hydrogen. If it's neutral, it have one electron. These are not bonding by charge, they're neutral, correct? Now watch, if this center, remember the proton's the very positive center, <coughs> and these electrons are found in the shell around them, correct? And so now do you see that the shells kind of overlap, and this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it pretty. That reaches out and grabs the electron that it owns, 
but it also grabs the electron it's sharing opposites attract and it binds kind of internally bond, bound by charge but they're not charged ions trying to, it's not like this trying to bond to that because that's not a fact it's really this bonding to that by sharing electrons they share them in common follow and by doing that they've done the same thing they're noble gases they're both like heating they they kind of like I I'm passing off as a noble I got two electrons just like helium the noble gas you know I drive a car just like the king of Saudi Arabia therefore I'm a king you know the same idea right I look just like it I drive a car he drives a car we're both kings that makes sense no it doesn't but that's okay you with me mm -hmm. so here's fluorine doing the same thing wow wow this is electron dot stuff isn't it Remember this? This good test review. If I counted fluorine, how many valence electrons should it be? Just look on your table up there. Boom. Double checking. Then if I dot it around, is this proper dotting? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many things would it want to bond to? One. And, and look, it's just one away from being noble, right? If it had one more, it'd be perfect, right? So you could imagine these are going to go like this and just share. Now this is like a noble gas, and this is like a noble gas. See how it works? Covalent bonding, so now I'm going to say bound by sharing electrons. And these are tight. They're tight how those electrons are held in there, very tight. All make sense? Net charge is zero. Strong attachment, bound by sharing. The other ones, the ionic was bound by charge. These are bound by sharing. Those are two different things. And it has implications for a lot of things that happen. Now, remember what we just talked about? Like the lattice? Like, you're like, what is lattice? No. Talking about the crystals like sodium chloride, sodium chloride, making the big crystalline thing, right? So we said, okay, in that case, I don't, I reduce it to the lowest number, correct? Now watch out, this is different. This is C6H6. It's got six carbons, it's got six hydrogens, agreed? So I've, if I was in the ionic world, I'd be going, oh, that's CH. I right? reduce to the lowest number. But we don't do that. Because here's, here's C12H12. If I counted carbons and I had hydrogens, it'd be C12H12. You could count that out if you want to check my work. I don't want to either. I'm too lazy. I've probably, probably had this slide for 10 years. It's been wrong. And, you know, no one ever counted it. You with me? In covalent bonding, you don't do that because it's totally different. Let me, let me make the point. This is benzene, is what it is, okay? It's actually cancer causing, okay? It's a solvent, we use it for sometimes, we use it in the hood carefully, because it is, you don't want to breathe it. And sodium chloride has a big time charge. But I surround the salt with enough water, it'll dissolve. That's why it's important you understand polar covalent, because otherwise nothing would make sense. Otherwise, there's no reason. And by the way, it's true. If I take something that is covalently bound, gasoline is co covalently bound with no net charge on it. And if I take gasoline and I pour salt in it, not a thing in the world happens. I'll demonstrate that to you, for you guys later. You'll see this, what I'm talking about. Okay? That, you know, if something's charged, you can dissolve something that's charged. If two things are uncharged, they don't even touch each other. In fact, they separate. And that's a key to a lot of things that happen in the world. All right? So that's going to be key. To, you know, cool talk. How does that pertain to us, right? Well, you, you start developing polymers. They have to adhere to te tooth, like, right? So the material of the tooth and the material of the polymer, they have to 
they have to bind. They can't just be, oh, this is cool. It's why it would be pretty, and it doesn't bind the tooth. It's of no use to. Correct? So that's why having these conversations. And the other part is, how do you get stuff off your teeth, right? That's the other part, and that has to do with this kind of stuff. So that's why we go down this road in this class. And I think just general science knowing, you guys should know why things dissolve, right? It's just important. Like, now you're scientifically literate a little bit, right? The only difference is, instead of just saying sharing, that's covalent bonding, it's unequal sharing. And it makes things charge up. Has a slight electrical charge. By the way, that's of no use to conducting electricity. Water is still non-conducting to electricity. An ion, though, will conduct electricity. It explains the solubility of many things in water, for example, like ammonia and alcohol. They also are polar covalent, so they bind in water. We'll talk that all out this year. Just not yet. Ready to get the third type? Think about what we did. So far, non-metal, metal, whoops, non-metal, metal, there we go. <laughs> we did non-metal, non-metal, so who's left? Metal to metal, right? So the bonding is very easy, we call it metallic. Now we're wimpy, two wimpy people trying to, you know, and here's how this looks, I mean, no offense, but we'll be the <laughs> wimpy ones. Just that way we don't get in any trouble with any of the women in class. Okay, so so here I am sharing with you and you're sharing with me. It's like, no, no, I can't hold this. No, no, yeah, no, 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 right? That's just, it's it's like they, we, we're like making and then we're reforming bonds like that rapidly. That's weird. But think about metals for a sec. I can break this bond. It'll reform almost instantly. All day long. Isn't that weird? I I love this is fun. I think this is the coolest thing. So iron happens to be a little magnetic, right? So the irons on top of each other, they they're oh I don't have another magnet to show you, but you know that magnets would align such that the opposite poles would attract. They want to hang out pole to pole, correct? So I have all these iron atoms, and you can imagine the little baby magnets in there are like going. No, here's an iron. It's got a north and south pole on it, right? So the one right next to it does this. So that way they can hang out and do the thing we're talking about where they're shifting electrons and they can be bound together, correct? Does that make sense? But I told you, these are very loosely held. So again, I demonstrate it like, okay, I'll break it and it'll reform just like that. But I, I this demo is better. I think this is pretty cool. I can actually get a magnetic field. Now watch. Here, I'll get another magnetic material around it. And we'll go, oh, nothing. I got no, there's no magnetism here. But watch. These things are bound so loosely. I, here's a magnetic field. I bring it over. Whoop, they're going to all align to this thing. They're all aligned. These are. They're like snapping into attention. They're all, right? So now all of a sudden, this is magnetized. Whoa. And this is so wimpy, excuse me. Get off! It's so wimpy with a little heat and a little. It's gone. <laughs> I mean, isn't that wild? On the, on the molecular scale, you could have had a poop. Oh, there's a field, right? I'm back. I'm gone. That's, that's so. metallic bonding. It's very loose. So it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Now, so now we're kind of stuck because, see, these covalents, they're bound tightly, right? They're not, they're, right? So, oh, yeah. They don't, they don't bond and reform. They just kind of snap, right? So what I need to do if I'm building a beam, which we're like, hey, wait, 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 wait. This whole building's built on iron. 
right? I mean, it's iron framework. Does that mean if I put weight on one end, it's going to go? That doesn't feel very good, right? So how do I get to stuff that's like, I don't know, metals that are that seem to be kind of durable, right? They seem stronger. I don't know, like that. Well, that's <laughs> like my scissors. There we go, right? This is this is strong metal. It's not bending and rebreaking, right? How do we do that, right? Does that make sense? So what we do is we just put a little bit of covalency into the iron because the covalent stuff breaks, so we mix it in. And so have you ever heard this term carbon hardened steel? Carbon bonds to carbon covalently, so it doesn't break, it doesn't loosely hold. And we dope that in there so the, the steel, the iron, is hardened with carbon and together they make the combination that's we build our framework out of. Does that make sense? So now it's not this kind of iron. Right? It's what we call steel, which is doped up with covalency. And other metals sometimes. Isn't that wild? This is, this is how it all ties together. Now, so here we go. Here's kind of the image of how we're doing this. That's shared. That's shared. That's shared. But the problem is, get that out of the way a little bit, they're loosely held, and when you heat them and pound them right, right, you know, you start heating it up, those electrons get loose and they start moving around. So they're loosely held, it's kind, it's kind of called the sea of moving electrons. So what are the implications for that? Well, if I put heat on one end of a wire, and you guys know this if you're cooking with metal, right? It's on the stove, it's been on there a while, you put heat on one end, you're like, ah, shoot. But plastic or the covalents aren't that way, like silicon cooking gloves, right? You, you use those for oven mitts, right? And you're like, ah, they don't heat up. Wood is kind of the same way. I, you're like, you heat one end, end of the wood if you can keep it from burning, and you're like, the other end is not even getting warm. But metal, it transfers through these loose electrons right on down the whole structure. Put electricity down one end, boop, 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 the electrons move right through, and so electricity travels right through this stuff. It's highly conductive. I want to insulate from electricity, grab a plastic. Right, water, water wires wrapped in plastic, and that way they don't shock you. Is this, this all starting to make sense? Like all the dots starting to connect, and you go, oh, ah, aha, it's all about bonding. It's all about bonding. So, what are we, what are we going to say now? Shared, but loosely shared. Remember covalent? Shared, tightly shared. Polar covalent, shared, unequally shared. Tight, but unequal. And then ionic, bound by charge. Heat and current travel on free electrons. Microwaves, oh yeah, microwaves target those loosely held electrons, if you've ever put metal in the microwave. Don't do it for a demo, but it'll, <laughs> it'll light right up. Which, by the way, in the lab, we used to like run metal reactions faster <laughs> by putting them in the microwave. So sometimes we are doing stuff that we're like, we want to explore this property, so we'll go to Walgreens or Walmart, buy a $100 microwave, put metals in it, run it, destroy the microwave, but you get the reaction and, you know, for $100 a pop for the research, it was worth it. That was fun. <laughs> they make new microwave reactors that don't do that. So you can capitalize on the microwaves because they would speed up metal reactions. You can imagine, right? If it was happening normally at room temperature, you put a microwave on it. So that's super cool, right? In my opinion. But metals can break and reform bonds. That's what I was doing here. Strong metals, what I think of is like, okay, but iron structure, steel, that's bronze, those are terms that are just mean they're normal metals that are facilitated or strengthened by something else, covalent. And that's it for these. Is everybody kind of tracking with this? Okay. So I'm going to push on through. We're doing good. We're not even to break yet. 20 minutes. 
see if we can get through all these slides. But why, when you go on break, I'm going to come back because I do love to demonstrate the charge on water and then the fact that if it was covalent, non-polar covalent, equally shared, it would have no charge. I want to show that to you guys. And then show you a little bit about the salt dissolving and all that. I can do that fairly easy in here. Okay? But let's do this right now. We're going to jump back to the math world. You guys ready? I don't think we got to it. We weren't doing this last week, right? Or we were? A little bit? Yeah. Okay, but I'm glad we I'm glad we revisited the bonding types because I think it's super important. So now you're just going to go. You're ready. The skill you would have if I said, okay, I'm going to bond sulfur to oxygen. What kind of bonding would it be? Covalent. And for you guys, you don't need to know whether they're polar or not yet. I'll show you tools later, next unit, where you could literally go. Oh, it's actually not only covalent, it's polar covalent. You could do that piece, but not yet on that. For right now, just, you know. Okay, you ready? What if I'm doing something like copper bound to nickel? Metallic. And how would you describe the uh, bond? Loosely shared electrons. It's always about electrons, right? And what if I said you got uh, chromium down to sulfur? Ionic. How would you describe the bonding there? It's bound by charge. So the chromium is charged what general charge? Because remember, it's, a, it's a, a transition, so I can't tell you exactly the number, but you could tell me the charge, positive or negative. Positive or negative? Positive. Positive, how do you know? Whips or they are they green? Metals, whips or green? Whips, so they lost the electron, so does that make them positive? Yes. Yes. And so then the sulfur end of things would be negative. negative. And in fact you could be specific. Negative on sulfur. Three. Two, two. Two. Yeah. So at least you know that name bond by charge. Correct? And I could get more specific here, like if you were doing this and this, you could literally figure out the charge and the ratio. Right? So we don't do tons of that this unit, but remember we practiced that a little bit? Charge on sodium? Charge on sulfur? Two minus, so if I go to make the compound, it's going to be? Remember how we can do that? That goes here, that goes there, that would be the right proportion to cancel out. The two minus canceled by two positives, that would cancel it, it would be neutral. Aha. Aha. Now, covalently, you don't do any of that yet, you don't know, right? You don't have any way to know if copper bond, or carbon bonds to oxygen, is it one to two, two to one? You don't know. We'll work on that later. Okay. All right, here we go. Calculators out. You guys ready to do this piece? We're going to do this math calculation, and then we'll be on the test review. A little demo and a little test review. All right. One little skill set. We kind of want to, we just introduced formulas to you a little bit or we can speak chemistry to each other. And I can go, okay, I'm going to make water, right? And then there's some things that we're going to figure out later that basically say, oh, yeah, okay. Now you know this. If there were two hydrogens, the hydrogens are bound to each other. And this oxygen, the oxygen is bound to each other. These would break apart and reform into this thing we call water, and it makes two of them, right? But these are actually in terms of how many? Right? Two hydrogens, one oxygen, two waters, right? But I can't count those. I can't say, oh, I got, I'm going to pick out two hydrogens, right? I, I mean, hydrogens are individually little, 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 right? They're, the, the, di the distance on them, right, across, I would have to shrink myself 
billions and billions of times before I start to literally see a hydrogen in my hand. Right? So I can't see it. So I got to count some other way so I get lots of them gathered. Right? And we talked about this. When I gather a bunch together, it's a mole, right? That's the amount I gather. It's a big number, but it's a fixed number. Who knows what that is? called Avogadro's number, kind of like an avocado, Avogadro, Av avocado's number, right? It's if I gathered those up, I now I could count, I could see those with grams, like I could see it on the scale, if I got that many together, it would be something I could measure. So according to this, if I had two moles of hydrogen, how many moles are implied here? What number? One. One. One mole of this, I would make two moles of water. So it's a two to one to two ratio. So we need to be able to turn moles into something we could measure on a scale, which is grams. So this is the thing I need you to be able to do. Go back and forth this way. All right? So we started in on this. this is, yeah, this is where we kind of ended up. So we're going to do molecular masses of compounds. We talked about this before. But now we're going to do the compound piece. You ready? So now I'm doing the stuff that we just did. Right, we did atoms already. Atoms to moles, moles to atoms, correct? Now we're going to do compounds. <laughs> Somebody help me, uh, what's the kind of bonding in here? Yay, okay, it's ionic, it's salt, right? Okay, what's the kind of bonding in here? Got to find beryllium. Can you find it? See it? I something like this. Look like what I see around the room. Feel good about it? <coughs> it's the molar mass. So if I literally, so these powders literally come, and I don't know. I could probably look around. There's not sometimes here, but we, it's organic, so it's a little bit different. But you know, if I just you could pretend, right? Pretend this is iron hydroxide. So now I'm going to do a, if I'm going to do a reaction and I need so many moles, right? If I look up there and I go, oh, I got some chemistry and it's going to take, you know, and in there I'm going like this plus something, whatever it is, then I go, oh, I need two of these, two moles of that. Well, now you can tell me how many grams is in every mole. 107. So 214 grams would give me two moles, mm. right? And that's something I could weigh. Now, if I said count, hey, count two individual iron three hydroxides, I'd be like, uh, <laughs> right? Because every one of these is literally billions upon billions of those. I'm stuck. I got, I got nothing. So we always think in moles. Follow? All right. And does that, like? I don't know. You may have heard about this in high school chemistry and you're like, what's a mole? It's such a weird thing. But does that start to make sense now? Like, yeah, I got to get enough together. I can weigh it on the scale or else it's useless to me. So just get you introduced to that concept. So now we're going to go do something different. Now if I had the grams, could I go back to the moles? And if I had the moles, could I go to the grams? Now this is different. This is, you gotta work off the molar mass. Right? So here's what I'm gonna show you. If I generally know the molar mass, which you just calculated, you just got that skill set down. Right? So I'll do the first one. So you guys tell me, it's 50 what? 58 point. Mm. How much? 44. 44 grams in every mole. True? That's what you figured out. Now I say, oh, I've got 5.82 e to the fourth grams. Holy mackerel. I got like 58 kilograms. That's a lot. That would be like, whoa. All right? So I've got 55.8 e to the fourth. 
So I'm gonna, I'm gonna write it out this other way, so just to remind everybody. Right? This is computer calculator language. Prior to that, your great-great-grandpa would not know what the heck he just put up. He'd go, I don't know what that is. <laughs> the only thing he would know is this. There's a mass symbol that looks like that. Totally different. That's different. That's raising to the natural... It's the, it's the inverse of the natural law. Okay, whatever. This, though, is this notation now. And we say, we got that. And I got to turn it to moles. Correct? And you go, wait, I got a conversion factor. I just figured out how to do that. So what should go on top and what should be on the bottom? Moles on top. And 58.44. Grams. And I can tell you how many moles. And the mass says... Do what with that? Divide. <laughs> I love that confidence. Like, yeah, divide. Like, yes, yes. Now that works. Now, if you, if if I was doing this problem from the very beginning and I had just gone through the trouble to calculate the sodium chloride, right? Sodium times one plus chlorine equals, and I had that answer on my screen, and then I set this up. The cool thing is, I could go. 5.82 EE, right? I'm just saying, however you'd enter it in your calculator, or psi, or whatever thing you're using for your calculator. I could go, some of you guys have a little cool answer key, like it remembered the last answer. And so, those probably do. That way I don't have to re-enter it all again. I don't have to re-enter that. So if your first calculation, you get an answer, then Later, you want to just use that answer if your number is the last time you hit an equal, whatever the answer was. Now, let me see if yours got, has that on there. Yeah, it's right there. It's, it's right above, second above your negative sign on this model. I see a lot of these in here. So you could reuse that answer if you'd already entered it. So that's kind of cool. And just to play, you can do like right now, you can go. Draw 58.44 times 1, which is 58.44. So How do you get 58.44? Hmm? Where did you get 58.44? 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 Where did you get Is everybody getting to a number? In that first one? How many moles? How many? 995, right? It's almost 1,000. That makes sense. I got 997. You got 995? It's all good. That will agree. That will agree. Okay, try these other two problems. They're now I'm going the opposite. I'm going moles to grams. And then the last one's like the first one. Which, by the way, I'm using the same molar mass you calculated. So it should still be in your notes. Then we'll be in good shape to take a little break. We'll check this work and then we'll take a break. While you take a break, I'll get some demos set up for you so you can see me. Bend water. Cool. Tricky, you know, teach you all these little party tricks. See the life of the party next time. Okay, you might get a balloon. I want to show you something. If anybody else is an aunt or uncle, it has a lot of mileage. Trust me, I've used it many times <laughs> with my nephews and nieces.
what happens, those cancel, and then these transfer the cancer is in the cancer. Have to see if you do it, I'm just done. I have to see you do it. I have to see you do it, I'm just done. Okay. Well, so. Well, this has a different molar mass, yeah, because iron hydroxide has a, has a different And then we're saying only one is three, so it's 3.00 moles, yes. right? Then we do that again. We're going to try to find friends, and then moles is right here to cancel. So right here is one mole. Oh, wait, no, no. We have key, let's say, I think. Can this 106? Grams. Oh, okay. So 106 and 87.8. This is so 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 he wants to say rotation también. Ah, pues a mí me lo puso. Mira, me lo puso. So he raised this one to 321. So the second round. What was he saying about the E? Huh? Okay. What was he saying about the E? Let's do a calculator. Let's push this or something. No, oh, no, más por si quiero usar esto, como si le hago clear, and I go to second this one, it remembers the previous answer. Oh. So if I do that plus times one, I remember the same answer. That's all he was doing. <laughs> no, I do. Yeah, because this is the, the one that we did over there and the other one on this one right here. Mm -hmm. Right? He, he wants to go, he has the conversion factor already. Yeah, my Right, so then notice that the way of doing this problem, if we have this, mm -hmm. he, he, has he has three moles, but he wants to turn it into grams, mm -hmm. or grams. He wants to turn it into three moles. ¿Cuánto pesa cada uno de esos? It's the same stuff we've been doing, but now it's from grams to grams and grams to moles. Yeah. It's the same steps, yeah, mm -hmm. but it's just different units. ¿Te das cuenta que esto, cuando dice grams per mole, me das cuenta que es este? Yeah, it's one gram. Or so 106 one gram. grams oh, is one mole. That right there? Yeah. 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 It was the original problem. Like I wish you could pause it. Huh? I wish there was a way to pause it. Yeah, like I chose something that you could have given me a hundred times. Like you can't stop and then record it. You don't have me, you can't, but it'll start a new video. Okay, here we go. Here comes the next one. Whenever I get around 321, I'm going to knock. Do you want me to check in real quick, see what's up? Okay, so let's see how you set it. So I would have done this more, this atomic mass Correct. times one, and then uh, oxygen yeah, so then times so. three. Yeah, this is, yeah, so this is already done. Right. That's the more mass you'll use in the calculation. And then times by three. Uh, let's see if you times it or not. Okay. So I'm going to do number two, right? We're starting off with three moles. Right, I'm going to back off so we don't know this, right? We've got three moles of iron 3 hydroxide. Correct? So now when I get done, I'm going to have grams come out on this side. So I'm going to actually put this in in such a way that it cancels the moles. This is the and these grams on top. And that was the calculation you did earlier where you figured out the molar mass of iron 3 hydroxide. Which was... I mean, you had it earlier. I'll just pop back to the other slide. It's right here. 106.87. So it's 106.87 grams per one mole. Follow? Yes. And then I just multiply it. Yeah, I have a different. 
molar mass. Yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah, I just saw it. it yeah. Like, yeah little... So you can back up and just say it's one iron, three oxygens, right. three hydrogens. Right. Double I might have to do my calculator. Yeah. Double check. Mm -hmm. And then this one. Oh, I did this. <coughs> 0.118. Yeah, I know. 0.118 on the last one. I need to it. What's the given? Can we try it? Maybe I better set it up too. Yeah, okay, here comes the last one. You ready? I had 25.3 grams of nickel sulfate, right? And when I get done, I'm going to turn it into moles. Correct? And then earlier, we knew how many grams per mole. How many grams per mole on this one? 213. 213. So this divided by this is certainly less than 1, right? And so that's where that number comes from. 0.118. All right. Take 10 minutes. Get back at 220. Do a quick down and we'll just start. Well, let me check. Yeah, that's it. That's it for the, this unit. We're ready to start getting ready for the test.